It is my honor and distinct pleasure to introduce our baccalaureate speaker this evening, Professor Ken Kilstrom. Dr. Kilstrom completed his undergrad, graduate, and doctoral studies at Stanford, all in physics, with extensive research in superconductivity, mathematics, and chemistry. It's also where he met and married the love of his life, Kim, while they were both students. The honors Dr. Kilstrom has earned are numerous, including Outstanding Undergraduate Physics Major, the Faculty Research Award, Teacher of the Year for the Natural and Behavioral Sciences three times, Voted Best Dressed Professor on Campus twice, <laughs> and Worst Dressed Professor on Campus five times. <laughs> he was honored as Physics Nerd of the Year seven times, and almost burned down Winter Hall during a class demonstration once, or was that twice? <laughs> While I am not a physics major, I have taken a class with him so I can personally attest that Dr. Kilstrom is one of those rare professors who does not assume everyone in the class is there because of devoted love and deep understanding of their particular field of study. Instead, he assumes that this may be your one and only physics class and wants to make it entertaining, fun, and possibly slip in a little bit of learning while you're just distracted. In class, he would blow up things, sometimes for a reason, but usually just for fun, and he wanted to. <laughs> to his students, he is always approachable, always ready with a story, and with many, many jokes, some of which were actually funny. <laughs> Two years ago, I was very fortunate to travel all around Europe and Israel with Dr. Kilstrom and his wife, Dr. Kim Kilstrom, of the Computer Science Department. Spending concentrated time with both of them allowed us to get to know them deeply, and we saw their character every single day. We became one 45-person family. And for me, it's a little awkward to keep calling him Dr. Kilstrom. So with no disrespect, from this point on, I will refer to him as Ken. During the semester, I got to experience Ken and Kim's absolute trust in God as they reflected on the numerous trials of their lives, especially the tragedy of losing everything they owned when their house burned down in the tea fire of 2008 while they were leading Europe semester. Their message was, Father, I do not understand you, but I trust you. Less than a year after we returned from, returned from Europe semester, that faith came to the ultimate test when Kim was diagnosed with cancer. After fighting for over a year, her body succumbed to the disease this past December. During this time, we saw both Ken and Kim demonstrate their character over and over again with their openness about the entire process of the good, the bad, and the ugly, as they posted updates on Facebook, keeping us all informed during a very difficult and personal time. Their transparency, honesty, and very visible reliance on God was an inspiration to us all. The two of them trusted God and trusted each other. I will never forget the day that when Kim told us of her diagnosis. She said that while she was at peace with the possibility of dying, her only worry was leaving Ken alone. But if the past year has showed us anything, it is that Ken, you are not alone. You have us and the thousands of other students that you and Kim inspired and loved. So now that you know a little more about Ken the man and Dr. Kilstrom, the physics professor, I know he has some very meaningful and personal words for us. So please join me in welcoming the truly amazing Dr. Kenneth Kilstrom. Um, 
Anyways, David really is an amazing young man and part of an amazing Europe semester. Um, at least some of those voices were female, and his mom would want me to point out that yes, he's still single. Um, I also want to thank the senior class for this honor. It means a lot to me, and you're always going to be a special class because you knew Kim and you knew us together. Um, and at least like a third of you were actually at our chapel talk two years ago. Um, <laughs> I, I want to thank your parents for entrusting you to us. Um, the, it can be a scary thing. There's, a, there's an old saying, you're only as happy as your most miserable kid. And I, I don't know about your brothers and sisters, but um, parents, your kids that you sent us are wonderful. You've done a great job raising them, and you should be proud of them. Um, they really are amazing. Um, their faith has undergone changes while they've been here, and, and that can be scary for parents of faith. My kids, when they went to college, their faith changed as well. And they don't agree with me on every issue, but they have a vibrant faith in Christ. But another old saying is when kids go to college, they don't lose their faith. They lose their parents' faith. But they need to develop their own faith, their own voice, because there are no grandchildren of God. The, the scripture passage um, is from the book of Joshua. And at this point, the Israelites have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years under Moses' leadership. But now he's gone, and it's up to Joshua to take him into the land. And it's a scary time. Um, for them. So God tells Joshua to be strong and courageous. He's going to need to be a role model for, for the people. And I, I kind of like this advice for you. Um, one of the things you find is major life changes are what leads to stress in your life. And pretty much you're guaranteed to have a whole bunch of major life changes. Um, whether you're going to graduate school, starting a career, or moving back into your room at your parents' house. <laughs> And by the way, your mom would be disappointed if I didn't tell you your room is now her office. And if you're gonna if you're gonna get it back, you will be paying rent. Um, but you're gonna need strength and courage. The world will challenge you not just in what you want to accomplish, but who you are as well. It wants to mold you. And and that's and one of the challenges that Joshua and the Israelites faced was their choices the, were gonna make more of a difference of whether they succeeded or failed. As Shakespeare put it, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Or more contemporary philosophers said, we have met the enemy and he is us. Um, but that's going to be one of the challenges for us. Your anchor should be your faith. Um, and just as, as the Lord tells Joshua and the people to meditate on the word, to hold close to the word, uh, that's what you need to do as well. What does strong and courage looks and courageous look like? Well, first it looks like Kirsten Moore. Um, we, we men Jenny mentioned Alex Moore's class. Kirsten lost Alex at such a young age and so early in her marriage. And yet the courage and grace that she went from there with her newborn child, Alexis, coaching basketball leading to a national championship, was such a testimony to all of us. And when the U.S. Basketball Writers Association named her the Pat Summit Award winner as most courageous woman, an award given at the final four. I mean, I, I wanted to be there for Kirsten, but she didn't invite me. Um, <laughs> anyways, it, it was a testimony to everyone. Joyce Louie, hiding out in the back. Four years ago, she accepted you to Westmont, but she and Chris faced their own battle with Chris's cancer, and Chris succumbed just a few days after Kim did. Yet, they were a role model for us um, on how to face you know, illness and potential death with courage and faith. Um, Ken and Neil has had five bouts of cancer since she was your age. And yet, just walking into her office is a spiritual experience as she holds on to her faith. Russell and Allison Smelly, everyone who's run cross country or track knows the challenges they've gone through, and I won't get them into them. But the faith that they have, I mean, they're my heroes. Um, Look at Jane Higa's courage, Jim Minoya's just loving care of Jane. Um, Alan Nishimura told me that when his beloved Amy was in her last year of life, he goes, that was our best year of marriage. 
and I wanted that to be true for Kim and me, and I, and I felt it would. These people are my heroes, and, and they should be yours as well. Um, role models matter. Um, you know, many mature Christians have what's called a life verse from scripture. Be because deep down I'm really shallow, I have a fragment of a verse. <laughs> um, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And sometimes that's harder th to live up to than others. Um, a, c a couple weeks ago, Dr. Beebe shared in a talk how life's challenges prepare us for future challenges. And it was a challenge when our house burned in the tea fire while we were leading Europe semester with the Vandermaids. Um, and, but it was amazing. I mean, we were in Jerusalem at the time, and I always say prayer is a local call in Jerusalem. But um, David mentioned uh, there was a plaque. A few minutes after we found out for sure that our house had burned, Kim found a plaque in the Garden of Gethsemane that had that, that end of the prayer that said, you know, in times of grief and distress, I don't understand you, Lord, but I trust you. And after that, Kim was fine. And that helped us when two years later, she was diagnosed with first stage three and then stage four ovarian cancer. Um, and we started a difficult journey together. One of the ironies is the happiest day of your life foreshadows the hardest day. You, you say in sickness and in health, um, till death do us part. And, and it looks forward to a time when one of you will say goodbye to the other. Um, and, and a lot of times we can be strong and courageous when we feel in control of our lives. The cancer takes that away from you. You're not in control of your lives anymore. And the courage and strength you get comes from your trust in the Lord's control. And that's where Kim put her faith. It helped that we had a great cloud of witnesses to support us. It helped that we have wonderful medical care. Um, Kim's oncologist, Dr. Julie Taguchi, her aide, Jesse, Kim's favorite nurse was Adrian, and they're all sort of hiding out in the back and pretending that no one can see them. Um, and we had wonderful friends, um, like John and Debbie Preston. John took every third Thursday off of work to fly Kim and me up to Stanford near the end when Kim was doing experimental treatments up there. Um, the Westmont community cared for us in wonderful ways. Um, Kim got literally hundreds of kind and thoughtful notes from current, former students, from colleagues and friends, describing the, the impact that she had had on their lives. Three days, sorry, three days before Kim passed, Lisa DeBoer organized, I'm sorry, give me a second. Lisa DeBoer organized faculty and staff to come to her house to sing Christmas carols to Kim and to me. But I was amazed mostly by Kim herself. She responded to all of this with the most amazing faith and thankfulness. She would have had every right to perhaps be resentful or even doubt God's love for her, but she never did. Um, she couldn't have been kinder or more appreciative to me. Um, she could have focused on how she was in need of care and people needed to care for her, but instead she cared for others. She would bake her chocolate chip cookies for each doctor's appointments. This could take a while. Um, and the cookies she had made for hundreds of students she was now making for the doctor and nurses that she loved. Um, at our last appointment up at Stanford, when the person, the doctor in charge of the trial said there was really no hope and no reason to continue, Kim's first focus was not on her future, but to immediately thank each of the people in the room for what they had done for her. Um, it, it, she, you know, we did have so much joy in that last year and a half. Lobster dinners, old friends that came and visited her and renewed relationships, you know, times with family. And it wasn't just an answer prayer, but it was a miracle that she was able to make our son Kevin and Katie's wedding. Because she was in the ER for six hours the day before and started an eight-day hospital stay the day after. But she was able to be there, and that just meant the world for her. Anyway, you know, in dark times, sometimes the only faith you can have is sort of the I believe, help me in my unbelief. Or when Jesus, a lot of his followers had left, and he turns to his disciples and goes, what about you? Are you going to leave as well? And Peter answers for them and says, where are we to, or to whom are we to go? You have the words of life. 
And in a way, I think of it as sort of a bottom rung faith where you're hanging on for dear life. But Kim's faith was so much deeper than that. Um, even in the most painful of times when she just wanted to be over, her kind and gentle spirit never wavered. Um, at the heart of it was thankfulness and a thankful spirit. I used to always quote C.S. Lewis, and he would say, every choice you make turns you into more heavenly or a more hellish creature. And I always thought that's what determines what you're like as you grow older, a lifetime of choices. But I think much more important is, do you go through life with a bitter complaining spirit, or do you go through life with thankfulness? I think that makes much more of a difference of who you are when you get older. Um, and, you know, so if you're going, you know, talk to your parents for a minute. If you're going through a difficult time medically or whatever, you know, develop a thankful spirit. Realize the wonderful care you're being given. And for the caregivers, know what a difference you're making to, to one who needs it most. Finally, I'm going to come back to, you know, the seniors. Um, and I want to focus on three areas of your life, starting with your faith. Um, our wedding invitation almost 36 years ago had the verse from Psalm 127.1 that said, um, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. I encourage you, get involved in a church. Wherever you go, get involved right away. Faith doesn't work on autopilot. Get involved in a small group. You need people in your life that know you inside and out and not just the image you project. The idea is to be strong and courageous, not just look strong and courageous. Next, figure out how you draw close to the Lord. For some of you, it's quiet time, um, or prayer, or solitude. Um, for some, it's just being in nature, taking long walks or even longer runs. My favorite Christian book is A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller. And, and it, he talks about sheep, and he goes, sheep don't get lost by peering over their shoulder, waiting for the shepherd to look the other way and make a break for it. Sheep get lost because they're nibbling away, they ignore the shepherd's voice, they get further and further until they're out of earshot. And we do that too. We drift um, away. Anyway, the second um, area I wanted to talk about is marriage. Now, not all of you want to get married. Um, and it may be that you're focused on your career and you see marriage getting in the way of your fulfillment there. It may be you've seen troubled marriages up close that weren't the ideal model of lifelong happiness. You may choose singleness, and that is a good and honorable choice, and you're in good company. The Apostle Paul talks about the advantages of singleness. Your focus should be on honoring God um, and, and becoming more Christ-like. It shouldn't be centered on finding a spouse. But I'd say without any hesitation, the thing I'm most proud of in my life is my relationship with Kim. And the greatest happiness has come from that. So for those of you who are going to marry, lay a good foundation for it. Kim's mantra, we have one other mantra today. Kim's mantra was marry for character. Because the person you marry is going to shape your character. Um, we, we've done, we did a fair bit of uh, premarital counseling. We would always ask people, why do you think God wants you to get married? And the answer would always come back, because we love each other. And yes, well, we kind of assumed that. Um, <laughs> anything else? Um, you know, are you stronger together than separate? Does the stronger lift up the weaker, or does the weaker pull down the stronger? Do you share the same faith? Do your families approve? Do your friends? Because I guarantee you, in your marriage, you are going to hit hard times where you question whether you marry the right person. And if you've run through stop signs on the way to the altar, that's going to be a tough question to face. Whereas if you were totally convinced it was God's will, it's a lot easier to get through those hard times. Um, and once married, never let doubt creep into your spouse's mind that you don't love them wholly and think the world of them. In, in my early days at Westmont, too often I let Kim wonder if I cared more about students than I did for her. Years later, when she also became a professor, she would pour herself into students' lives. But I never once felt that she loved me any less because of it. And also, when children come, don't let them become more important than your spouse. First, your commitment to each other can be the greatest <coughs> gift you give your children. But second, eventually they are going to grow up and leave, and you want to have a relationship that's still there. The third area is your career. We long to make a difference that lasts. Recently in England, a set of footprints 
that were reportedly 900,000 years old. Apparently, there was a little notation that the Cubs had just won the World Series. <laughs> how long will our footprints last? And, and how do we make lasting impact? But also, how do you begin? There's another old saying, I have lots of old sayings. Um, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And from your first interview, be as interested in the people as you hope they are in you. Do your homework ahead of time. Get to know them. Make sure you ask questions. And once you start to work, work hard. A couple weeks ago, I was listening to a, a radio talk show. I actually heard Mark McCormick, Mark the RD, called in. I recognized his voice. And, and he said he would always tell students, if you faithfully do your job every day, you're going to be employee of the month every month. And there's a lot of truth to that. And, and it's not my life's verse, but the scripture that's had more practical impact than any other is from Matthew 5.41. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Always look for ways to do more than what's required. It'll reshape your attitude and it'll also reshape your, your reputation. Because it makes a huge difference when something's done voluntarily because you want to do a good job versus if it's forced on you. I also want to look 25 years into your future if things don't go well for you. Um, maybe the strong faith you have now will be a distant memory. Our, our church is doing a series when bad Christians happen to good people. Sometimes the Christian body just drives people away. Um, it may be a life's tragedy has turned you away from God. It could be your, your fulfillment came only from your successes and your failures hardened your heart. Um, it may be like the sheep that Phil Keller talked about, you drifted away. You may even want to come back and you don't know how. I have two pieces of advice, one from an evangelical pastor, another from a shopkeeper in the old city of Jerusalem. Pastor Dave Roper said, no matter how far you walk from God, it's only one step back. And the shopkeeper, Moshe Kapensky, would say, and his love for God totally dwarfs my own. And he said, you know, you take care of the want to about loving God and let him take care of the how to. The third area is marriage. And for this, I speak from my own experience. Um, when Kim and I did the chapel talk that at least 28 of you were at, um, <laughs> we talked about a time when our marriage really had struggled and cooled. Kim, Kim struggled with a lot in her life, but including, including cycles of depression. Um, a decade ago, she wasn't happy, despite amazing professional success. That year, she was Teacher of the Year. She won the Faculty Research Award. One of her papers was named the best paper of the entire year in a, in a computer science journal. But she sunk into her deepest depression. Yeah. Um, I was chair of a church that was melting down with our closest friends, Tim and Lynn, at the, at the center of the storm. And a, f a few months after that, Kim asked me to move out. Um, and, and I asked her, give me a month to show that it can change. Um, it's not that she had given up on her marriage, but she knew she couldn't handle the marriage as it was then. And I said, give me a month. And I realized at that point, it didn't matter whose fault it was. If she didn't feel loved, it was my fault. And I made it my mission in life that she was going to feel loved. I hid Hershey's kisses all around the house. And if she found one, she could exchange it for a real kiss. This went on for months. On Valentine's Day, I put roses each place she would be during the day. And on her birthday, I gave 30 roses to 30 people to come give to her during the day. You know, it wasn't too late for us. Um, Kim blossomed and our marriage bloomed again. Um, and even cancer couldn't get in the way of that. Caring for her wasn't, wasn't a duty or, or a dreary task. It was an honor and it was a joy. Um, and I, I thought, what would it be like to go through cancer alone? And she never let me forget that I made a difference for her. And if I was making a difference, I could do anything. I could go through anything. Um, and, and so again, talking to your, you know, the people out there for a minute. You know, if you're going through a hard time in your marriage and you wonder if it could ever be good again, what would, how would your spouse react if you were all in? If you were totally committed to that marriage, would they blossom again? Would you? Uh, 
there's only one way to find out, and I guarantee you it's worth trying. Um, you know, a few days before Kim died, two of our pastors, John and Lori, came to pray for her. And I remember as I was praying, thinking, 35 years ago, Kim's dad had put her hand in mine, and now I felt like I was putting her hand in God's. So, so when you get married, and you say the words in sickness or in health, or till death do us part, say them just a little more slowly, and think about what they mean, and, and look, look ahead to being there for it. Finally, what if your work isn't fulfilling? What then? Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> <coughs> You're on your own. <laughs> but I do want to leave you with one final thought. <laughs> Not about work. Um, the first thing that Joshua does when they, when they cross the Jordan is not take down Jericho, it's to set up memorial stones to remember what God had done. Um, and we need memorial stones in our life for what God has done. When you see the risen Christ at work, those are memorial stones. For me, when Kim was thanking those people up at Stanford, that was a memorial stone for me. Kim's cookies were a memorial stone for me. And by the way, this morning I baked 550 cookies. And on your way out, some of the heroes in my life are going to be right there handing them out. So each of you can take one. And yes, I made enough for you guys as well. <laughs> and there's probably going to be even some left over, so your parents can try and push you out of the way. And just, um, but anyways. So finally, make a difference in the world, absolutely through your care, your career, but make a difference to the people you love.